This is a film dimension interview. Today I am speaking with Leon Lopez. We're going to be speaking about his career, his work. Yeah, Leon has directed, he has acted, he's done lots of things. Uh, Leon, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm very, very good. Very, very good. Um, yeah, as we were just saying just before, um, you know, you, you've done lots of things in your, your career. Um, with, I was looking up, we're the same age. We're both born in 1979. Um, you've done so much more. Than I'll I have. Your um, I'm 11th of September, no, I, 79. Oh, so you're a Virgo as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so we're both. I'm we both there. Ah, yeah. wow. Okay. So, yeah. And there's no such thing as I've done more than you've just done different, haven't we? It's like, and that's not me being humble or anything. It's like, I'm sure, sure things you've done in your life that I've never done doesn't mean that I've done, you've done more, does it? We've just done sure. different. Sure. Yeah. D different, different paths, but we're, we're speaking now. But yeah, we're, we're, again, I, I always, it's, I don't know if you find this, it's relating to other people who are the same age as you. I always find really difficult, you know, certainly if people have been, say, like famous for a long time and you're kind of like, oh, they're older than me. You know, like they've been doing that and they're like, oh my God, they're the same age as me. You know, like um, <laughs> you know, like actors, or whatever, or uh, wh whoever, you know, and, and you just kind of think like, wow, like they're, they're the same age as me or maybe even younger. You know, like, oh my God, they've been like famous for like 20 years, <laughs> like, you know. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's yeah. whenever I see someone the same age, it's always uh, a strange thing. I don't know many people from my year, to be honest. It's really weird just thinking of it like that. I don't, he, most of my friends Ledger, are either older or younger. I think Heath oh, Ledger was 79. You know, he was born in 79. Was he? Um, yeah. But so even in my would... friend circle, I'm thinking, like, I don't know many people who are my friends who are like the same age or same year. Yeah. If we were a bit of a weird year, I don't, like 79, isn't it? It's like, a... anyway, it's gone completely off track. You're going to get that <laughs> sure. a lot. So but, I but no, no, but I know, I know what you mean, actually. Yeah, a lot, a lot of my friends are uh, younger than me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, we don't quite fit. We're not, we're not 70s or 80s. But anyway, um, yeah. So how did you first get involved in wanting to act? Did you want to be an actor? Did you kind of come into it by mistake? Like, what was, what was your journey? Um, so my okay it's, uh, i've said this lots of times and I, every time i say it, i always find something out and something new out but i never really wanted to I, I always wanted to like when i was a kid um the same old story of oh i used to play around in the living room and i did like with my it's my nieces and nephews and like my brothers and stuff they always talk about it it's like i used to watch a lot of films and a lot of them would be musicals like my favorite film even to this day really is greece you know the the uh, film of the show so with John yeah. Travolta and Olivia Newton John. So since and I found out that was released in 1979, and my mum went to see it when she was pregnant with me. Wow, and it's okay. weird because it's like I've just I'm a, like I used to you know word for word I used to sing all the songs, and then I'd make everybody around me kind of act them out. We'd act scenes from it. I'm gonna sure. say me. I used to think it was mutual, but I found out <laughs> last week that apparently I was just really mean and I used to force them to do stuff. Yeah. But um, so. I kind of had a real link to that film and a lot of it was the music within the film. And as it's yeah. grown up, even now analyzing it and stuff, I just think the structure of it's really great. Like the way as a musical film, it's like probably one of the best ever put together, you know, sure. dramatic elements, the music, the characterizations, all that kind of crap. But um, I was interested in the songs more than anything and singing. And then I always had a love for, for music and I wanted to be a singer. And then all my family used to laugh at me when I was singing because they said I wasn't very good. And I was like, no, I'm going to be a singer. And I'd practice mm. and then I'd write songs. And um, when I was in like the kind of transitional years, like leading up to teens and stuff, I used to go out an awful lot when I was when I was younger. And a lot of my, I was always had more of a link to girls, I guess, than boys. And mm. I always played with the girls more, but be forced to play with the boys. And then growing up, realizing that I was gay, I didn't realize till quite late on, but um, well, in my teens still, but I stayed at home quite a lot. Once I started realizing that I kind of had crushes on friends that I shouldn't have more than anything. So I locked myself right. away. And I used to kind of sit in my room, like writing poetry, writing songs and things like that. And just recording it on a I had a little cassette deck. It was a cafe cassette deck I think I remember the make of it and it was to link to my I had a spectrum computer so I used yep. to load the games on the tapes but I used yeah, to use yeah. the tapes and record over them and these songs 
like send them into like Blue Peter and songwriting competitions. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's the little my mum's laugh. But literally bit by bit, I was just, I always had a link to music. And then at school, yeah. I play instruments because we do like after tests and play the violin, all this kind of crap. And then just, I just realized I wanted to be a singer. That was it. That's all I ever wanted. And it was a bit of a, it wasn't really many paths to kind of do that really when I was younger and be like, I'm from mm -hmm. Liverpool 8, um, Toxteth, and it was never really a thing. Even though we had like some pop groups who'd made it like the real thing and whatever, it was still a bit, um, anyway. So then what happened was these neighbors happened really. So, and Kylie Minogue happened. And then yeah. I was like, oh, she'd gone into, she was so popular and became a singer. And I was like, well, yeah, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to become an actor. <laughs> Because in my mind, becoming an actor wasn't hard, but becoming a singer was. So I was like, I'm going to get into acting and sure. I'll get into a soap and then I'll become a singer. And literally, it, it was so weird in my mind, it was that simple. So then I kind of was always doing my music. I joined a few bands when I was like 15, 16, um, part of like drama groups um, in Liverpool. And then I um, was kind of... So my training kind of came through that. There was no youth theatres or anything. I was yeah, part of the yeah. Liverpool Everyman Writers Group as well because I like to write. So I'd be writing plays and stuff from like the age of 15, 16. And then when I was um, at school, we didn't have any drama classes. So this mm -hmm. you're going to regret asking me these questions because my answers are so long. No, but, no, no. No, it's um, fascinating. <laughs> We did, um, whenever they needed people to do stuff like public speaking or whatever, or get up and uh, do excerpts, especially when, when we were doing our GCSEs, I'd get up and always volunteer because I was the most annoying kid <laughs> in the class. We'd always be putting his hands up. Um, and then uh, the school realized that I just had a, I did have a love for performing. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I won the, to the Toxteth Rotary Public Speaking Competition, um, which was quite a big thing for my school at the time. And then the Liverpool, every man were looking for supernumeraries, you know, like the spear carriers and soldiers to be in the yeah. Scottish play. I don't know if I can say it, you know, the Scottish yeah. play. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, the relaunch of the Liverpool, every man. Um, so there was a guy called Gary Olsen, um, who used to be in 2.4 Children. He passed away now, but he was playing the lead and um, there was loads of actors, like people who've gone on to do great things and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, people who were all doing great things at the time. And I was just thinking, well, it's something to do. I was enjoying it. We got our expenses paid. And then whilst we were doing, I was thinking I was 15 at the time and we were doing it every single night, loved it. And then at the end of it, me and three of the other lads did like a little hits from the show kind of thing where we took on all the different characters and run through yeah. and put it on for the cast. And all the way through the show, everyone was like saying, you know, what do you want to do? I said, I don't really know what I want to do. I want to do this, want to do that. I thought maybe I want to be a, a lawyer, I wanted to be a journalist, all these kinds of things. Mm. And then in the back of the program, like all the act all of the actors were like, um, what you need to do is actually there was one actress, Naomi, um, what was her second name? I can't remember, but she went on to being like coronation. She's done lots, but she'd put, um, you know, you're questioning what you want to do, um, what you need to be as an actor. And it was just that one comment that made me realize I was like, yeah, okay, this maybe this is something that I could do because you know. Yeah. But then I went to my careers advisor and at the time I was um, just about to do my A-levels. No, I'd done the first year of my A-levels actually. So I must've been about 16. Um, and I was doing three A-levels and I just said to my careers advisor, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go and do drama. So then they were like, oh, well, Liverpool College do a great drama course to BTEC equivalent to your A-levels. So I auditioned for it and got in. And then I did two years there and at that time I was also, I joined a boy band in Liverpool uh, and we were um, uh, writing songs and touring around. We did like, at the time there was lots of those festivals which used to go on like um, Party in the Park and all these, all the radio stations yeah. at the festivals. And we managed to get on the circuit of that. So it was at the time of like bands like Atomic Kitten and Damage and uh, yeah. 911 and whatever. And we weren't signed, we were just doing it off our own back. Yeah, um, Austin, who was the lead singer kind of, was writing most of the songs and producing it all. So at the same time, I was at college. I was doing this, and then I uh, we got signed to a management company um, who managed Cleopatra. You know the girl band. Yeah, yeah. The girls, and then um, we spent a bit of time with them, and then that didn't really work out. Then we got nominated for a Mobo Unsigned Award, so we got to go down to London. And then at that time, I'd just got an audition for Brookside, and I was doing it. I was so I got the part as Jerome. 
and I was playing like um, I was like a monthly contract recurring character. So right, right. You no, know, I was in it all the time. I was actually only being booked month to month. So, and then our manager Erskine at the time was like, you know, keep it going because that'll help with the band. So yeah. then um, that kept going on and on and on. Then we were doing showcases for like different record companies. And then our manager died. Uh, he passed away, uh, sadly. And then we were like, we'll give it a go. Because wife took over for a little bit to say, look, see if we can get you signed. Because he put all this work into us. Mm. And then we did the showcases. It didn't really come off. And then I went, uh, we were thinking to keep it going. And then I went to Phil Redmond at the time. And I was like, look, you know, I'm doing." they all knew I was doing the music because they enjoyed it as well. They used to come to gigs yeah. and stuff. And I said, look, the band, I don't know which way to go. And um, but if you give me a full time contract, then I'll stay here. And he was like, yeah, you know, the character's going well. And then give me a full time contract, left the band. And then the music kind of went by the wayside. I was still doing bits of music on my own, writing and doing stuff mm. like that. And then Brookside was for lasted for four years. And then I just decided I wanted to leave after the fourth year. And I wanted to do more music. Um, and again, I had a meeting with Phil Redmond. He was like, great, you know, if you want, would the show will always be here. So you can always come mm. back. So then they didn't write me out. I just kind of went away for a while. And then 12 yeah. months later, the show got pulled off the air. And I was gutted because I thought, I want to just stay. That was your way of it, yeah. 12 months. But um, so literally, there. But those four years of Brookside was kind of like my, even though I'd gone to drama college, like that was like, I'd actually... Another bit that I'd missed, I'd auditioned, I applied for drama schools as well. So I got accepted into Middlesex, which was a university, and I got accepted mm. into Liverpool. And I chose to go to Middlesex, but then I took a year out in between because I was like, I wanted to focus on the band. Um, yeah. So that was before Brookside. And then obviously Brookside happened. And then the amount of training that I got on that job was just crazy. Like it was the most, you know, I work at Hollyoaks now uh, quite a bit direct in there. And mm. most of the crew, most are all the same people who've been there since I was a oh, kid. So it's like yeah. going home there. But like everything that I've learned from directing really was learned on that job. You know, um, Brookside was a single camera shooting drama, kind of like what Hollyoaks is now. So the mm. way you know, Phil Redmond had designed it. So it's the same way that they shoot some of the big budget dramas. It wasn't like a soap at the time, which everything was using multi-camera. So mm. it kind of had a bit of a different edge. So you learn about like crossing the line. You learn about like lighting styles and techniques because you're lighting for single camera. Um, and I'm not saying every actor does, but I've got an inquisitive mind. I was always interested in why things are the way they are, what they do. Yeah. Asking questions. And at the time, I didn't realize why I was asking questions. Um, and I guess it kind of paid off in the end because it was that whenever I was doing other work, even when I'd gone on to do other things, again, it was like learn. Even now, if I I haven't done anything for a while, but whenever I do an acting job, I'm always watching the DOP or like the sound uh, department and watching where they're placing the microphones or if they've got a different microphone, why they're using it or, you know, what. Just quizzing things because it really helps me when I know stuff. And I've always truly believed like, when I started directing, um, I didn't necessarily pick up a camera to be a director. I wanted to, um, I'm going really off topic, but so basically, okay, what happened was years had gone by, uh, I decided I was doing a lot of musicals and doing a lot of theater in London. And I was working with lots of actors who weren't really getting the break. And they all saw me as a TV actor going into musicals and like trying yeah. to shake that stigma off was quite hard. But I was working with great people who wanted to do TV and all the questions would be about that. So then um, I was like, I want to make something. So I got a friend of mine who's a writer to write a script for me. And it was only 20 pages and I cast it with friends and people who I know and I was going to be in it. And I got another friend who had a camera who'd been to film school to make it. And anyway, we shot it, I produced it and I was in it. And um, when, it, when it took him ages to put it together, bless him. But when it come back, it wasn't really it just didn't look the way it looked like I thought it was going to look, sure. you know, the lighting wasn't right, all these things. Uh, I'm a friend who wrote it. He's like quite a big writer in television. And he was like, look, you know, I don't really want to put my name to it. Not because <laughs> right. it, people were, but it just didn't, it just, you know, because we thought yeah. we were going to, at the time, the internet was just taking off. Well, being you know, there like things like YouTube and stuff were quite big. So we were like, we'll put it online and whatever. Um, it was about 2011 or 2012. And then, um, so I said, well, the only way in my mind, I was like, well, the only way I'm ever going to make something the way I want it to be is to learn how to do it myself. So yeah. then I'd gone yeah. off on tour to do We Will Rock You um, for a year and a half. And at the time, my friend had just been to LA and he came back to the UK and he had a showreel made 
specific, like over there and you know pe- everyone's doing self-made show reels but no one was doing it then so i was like it looked like csi miami and then i looked up the company and i seen how they make and they were making it with dslrs and dslrs had only just come out then mm-hmm. you know canon um it was the first to kind of do it so sony had just released their first um dslr with film capabilities and it was like 500 quid or something so when i was on tour i bought it and then I had a little Zoom phone. And then I was using the tour to practice. Vi- I was making video blogs and I was practicing editing and things like that. So we made a little kind of television show and I did it multi-camera with two cameras. And my um, my um, the changing room part was the presenter and we'd interviewed the different actors in the show. Uh, and then um, it, got in, it got to a certain point where I was like, well, I want to kind of move on to maybe do drama. So a couple of the actors wanted to do some scenes. So I was like, well, I'll shoot them for you and I'll write stuff. And then I got some of my old plays that I wrote at the Liverpool Everyman. And I was like, I shot them as like short films. And then I just started a little kind of sideline business where I was making showreels for actors. So they'd say what they wanted. I'd write the scene for them or sometimes they'd come with the scene. So I'd write the scene for them. And bit by bit, I was investing in equipment. So I'd bought like boom, I had my cameras, buying bits of light and stuff. So then I started, that really and loads of people started booking me and to be honest i was making more money from that than where i was from acting and but 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 it sounds of it it's like literally you you just found a way to do it you just did it do you know what i mean you like you you forced you forced your reality to become what you wanted it to be just by going and doing it yeah just yeah getting ahead and i don't even think I mean, forcing, you know, I get what you mean by saying forcing, but I don't even think it was like a forcing of anything. I just think it was like a natural progression of what, like I wanted something. I wanted something, I wanted to make something. I thought I would, and just sometimes you think you want something, but what you you do want it, but you don't want it in the way that you think you want it. And what yeah. I wanted to do was make something. And I thought I wanted to make something to be in it when real in reality, I wanted to make something that meant something. And that's what I got. So making this thing that we'd done, it was like, I thought it was for me to be in it. And I really enjoyed the story, but it was like, no, I would really want to tell these stories, but no, I'm not being given the opportunity to tell them in the work that I was doing. So it was yeah. a case of, well, I want to tell the stories. And then my initial idea of thinking I wanted to be in them, the more I started doing it and the more I started early on putting myself in them, thinking actually this isn't, this doesn't feel right. Being on this side of it and actually being in control of like shaping the story. And, you know, I've got a massive, I've got a love for editing. You know, I learned that really early on and I love kind of telling stories through editing, through cuts. Um, so that became more of a passion than anything. And then, um, you know, right, making some of the short films that I'd written, because at the time, you know, I, when I was a kid writing those things, when I was like 15, 16, it was like looking back now and I look at them, because there were so many kind of clues that was given away about my struggles with my own sexuality and that I didn't yeah. really click at the time, you know, and those things, I think these are really important stories that were important to me. And actually the messages in them could be important to other people going through similar things to me. Yeah. So it was yeah. that that kind of happened. And it was like um, when I went to, I did, I'd written, I was in a show called Elegies. Um, well, I've done, like, there was a rent, a musical called Rent, which is about um, a group of uh, youngsters in New York. And one of the main storylines was around HIV and AIDS. And my character played Collins, who was like a, a guy living with HIV. Um, so from early on, I had a big kind of, and it was one of the first, when I was like 20, I went to New York and it was one of the first, play- oh God, so this is another tangent. When I was at college, actually, one of the boys who um, was in my group, we were doing our final project. He'd just come back from New York with this soundtrack and he played it to us all. And it just literally blew my mind. And again, I hadn't, wasn't fully out then. I think, I don't even think I was out at all, um, but I knew in myself what I was. And then um, we were like, we use the music from that show and we like basically plagiarized a lot of it and changed all the lyrics to put and made our own mini musical from that. And we all got distinctions in our course and it was like, it was rent. So when I was, when I got (laughs) the first year of Brookside, when I got paid, I booked a trip to New York because I wanted to go and see the show. So I saw the show and I sat at the back of the show and I was like in bits, just sobbing my eyes out, like 20 years old, just on my own. And I was like, wow, I want to be in this show. And then spring forward five or six years and they were auditioning for it in London. Um, and I auditioned for it and I got offered a part as Benny and then the guy who played Collins, which was the role I always wanted to play, dropped out because he got another job. 
And then I got bumped up to play that part. And it's just fucking weird. My life is weird. And whether you believe in the secret or not, I don't know. But the, literally, I was like, I want to be that character. And I got offered the job, but I didn't get the part. And then something happened to give me the part. Yeah. And then I played that part like three times now. Well, anyway, I'll just, I'll go just on. to in, in to interject, from everything that you've, you've explained to being at school to way what way you just said when you, you got the got the part in and read looking back do you do you feel that it could have been any other way than the way it was um because it, it sounds like i don't feel it, i feel like this it, it, it almost feels like a kind of i mean i'm a believer in i'm quite a spiritual person i say spiritual more than religious although i do yeah, believe in I, religion, I get that. but it's like I do believe that this is the life that I chose before I came here. I do 100. percent I don't it necessarily sounds like it. You know, it really, it really no, sounds like, like my life is just absolutely insane, and I'm so thankful for what it is. And you know, mm. like ups and downs. I wouldn't necessarily wish this career, like a career in the arts, to anybody because it's a fucking struggle. Of course. Of course. And I teach sometimes at drama schools with young kids, and I'm like, you know, not even young, like in the teens and twenties. And I'm like, you know, if you don't love it, just do not do it because you are not going to make a lot of money. I'm in a position now through directing where I'm actually getting a regular wage. But apart from Brookside, which was 20 years ago, this is the first time that's happened. And apart mm -hmm. occasionally being on like some shows that have run for a year or so, you yeah. don't make money from this industry, like unless you're very lucky. Some people do. But also, if you're getting in it because you want to make money, then you're in the wrong. It's got to be about love and passion. And yeah. it doesn't matter what you get from that passion. But, you know, some people do it because they want to be told they're great. We all want to be told we've done a good job. My thing is I'm like a little pet dog in a job. And I'm like, I just want someone to say good job. And it makes me happy. It's like, <laughs> yeah, sure. that's it, you know. But some people need it. for. You've got to also understand why you want something and why you need it. It's like if it is for validation, in the wrong way that's going to feed your ego to cut or you know try and fill in the cracks of something that's missing then you're going to end up but then again it's like why do i need to be told that i've done a good job i don't know maybe that is who knows but for some reason it works well within me and my mental health balance is quite is sometimes it's up sometimes it's down but generally it keeps it in a decent place but the most important person when it comes to anything is yourself so it's like and this industry i've seen it especially with young artists when i was doing show reels for people and you get a lot of young people out of drama school and some of the stories they tell me and i'm just like you need to give yourself a break because seriously you are not going to last five minutes in this industry because everybody is going to have an opinion on what you do everyone is going to tell you you know and if you believe everybody it's that old saying isn't it if you believe all the good things you've got to believe the bad things so the best thing is just don't believe anything just say thank you <laughs> so thank you for that you know i used to come out to the stage door of doing shows and people would go oh my god this was great and i'd be first thing my defense mechanism would be oh no because at this bit i made a mistake and oh my voice cracked here and it's like let it go you just ruined that fucking experience <laughs> experience yeah. that 20 year old kid that 20 year old leon who was sat at the back crying his eyes out if i went to the side and met the character the guy who played collins and he just poo pooed something that changed my life how shit would i feel yeah. do you know what i mean and that's what i've got self-destruction mechanism that person watching the show is not watching it for you they're watching it for their experience and sometimes yeah. we have to take ourselves out of the equation and go you know what their experience is the most important thing to them and although mm -hmm. my thing of whatever it's like but don't spoil somebody else's yeah just, anyway, no, just I, I get that I, t I totally get that um but, but, but again you, you kind of already touched upon it that people perhaps maybe watching this i i always kind of ask you for this because I suppose because I'm asking for myself as well. But people that maybe get to watch this because they made a short film or they want to make a short film, they've got this story they've got to tell. It's and it's it's hard. It's it's really really hard in the creative industry, as you've already said, and you know from your experience, you've just explained that. What what is what's what is it about the industry that stops? Not so much even stops people making stuff because loads of people are making stuff. But why do so few people get to the point where they can be, you know, multimillionaires and really, really famous? And it's that that you know that whatever one percent, two percent, whatever it is. Why is there so many people's dreams, ambitions, and stories and ideas that are all as good as the other ones that never seem to? Um 
this resource, you've got to remember it's a business. This is a business. If you want to make money, you've got to come from a business point of view. If you want to tell stories, you're not in the don't don't look don't look at the business side of it. So no one really makes millions and millions and millions apart from the big big businesses. No independent mm. films make a lot of money. So if you're if you want to tell a story, but also you want to be a millionaire, you're in two different games. Sure, does that sure. make sense? Yeah, you want yeah, to tell yeah, a story, a storyteller and a filmmaker. So go out and tell them stories. And you know what? Sometimes something might get picked up and it might get a bit of success and traction and lead onto something else. It's like me. It's like early on, I was telling all these things that I want to tell. And now I'm in mainstream soap opera telling, you know, that's not, it's not the same thing. It's not me picking a story about these two people sitting on the park bench saying how lonely they feel and how life can change them. I'm not going to get that direct in an episode of soap, but it's not, a, it's not the same thing. Yeah. It's led yeah, yeah. to that. Give me the opportunities to do that. But then if I also want to tell those stories, which I'm lucky enough to tell, still be able to do, I do that in my own time. You've got to, sure. you've got to really know what you want. And I think a lot of people confuse it and think it's the same thing. It's not. Yeah. So it's like, you know, but if you want to be famous, then there's a route to do that. If you want to be a famous director, there's a route to do that. So what you do is you create a couple of short films, but you don't create them necessarily out of your love and your passion. You look and you go, well, what is something that is going to be accepted at Cannes? What's something that's going to be accepted at Toronto? What's going to be accepted? At? And you tailor make, this happens all the time. You tailor make the project for those festivals because yeah. they have specific types of remits that they take. Cannes Film Festival does not take the same thing as the BFI Film Festival. They won't, you know, generally you'll get a crossover, but the things that they want in their short film festivals, if you get to do a short film festival, like if you get a short film that has success through that way, then find a feature film, a low budget feature film, but you're not going to find your passion project isn't going to get you it. You have to recreate something that's going to get a bit of traction, get you a bit of press, get, you know, win an award. And from winning that award, you will then go on to be able to, to direct um, a drama, maybe like a primetime drama mm. that is going to, you know, maybe you you won't get in the lead episode, then you won't get like the you won't be able to create it, but you might get you know episode four or five in it, and then if you do well on that, you'll keep getting booked. That's that that's that thing. That's that track. But if you want to make films to be rich and famous, then it's it, the two different things. If you want to make films and tell stories, just make films and tell stories. You don't need money. You don't. Uh, well, you do. You need money to buy a camera. You need a couple of soft boxes or LED panels. You need a boom, and you need the actors. Because everything else, take the story. If you want to make, you know, if you want to tell your life story, you want to tell the story that's the biggest passion to you. Generally, it's going to be quite domestic anyway. So you look at what locations you can get for free. You look at your friends who are really talented enough. You know, you cast the right people in the parts. You get the equipment that you need. And you go out and you spend a weekend or a few days and you shoot that project and you edit it together and you create the work that you want to create. And that's it. That's the, the, we need to realize that it's a, it, they're not the same thing. Being a successful, uh, well-paid director in mainstream television and film is not the same as going out there and creating the films that you want to tell a story because you want to move people. Sure. I, I think a lot of people don't get told that, you know, if, mm. you, if you're well, you in don't film know. school. Yeah. I've only learned it. I've only learned it from the last 20 years of kind of, well, you know, being directing properly since like for like five or six years. And it's only dipping into all these different fields that I go, oh God, this is, this is different. But also it's like, I'm lucky enough that I'm make, I'm working in like mainstream TV and I can earn money to keep me going. But mm -hmm. I've still got this passion for these other films and these stories that I want to tell that I'm working on the back end, you know, behind the scenes, trying to make happen, mm -hmm. you know, and whenever you've got a bit of a gap, but you need to make that time. Because now about two years where if it wasn't blue, I was living with and stories, around kind of loneliness and corroded or whatever and it was only because i had that time where i wasn't working but i'm booking working now and you finish a job and they book you on the next one so mm. it's got to the point where it's like i'm booked till december now and thank god you know with all of the craziness that's going on that i've got these opportunities but then come sure. next year if i want to do the other things that i want to do for i've got to make sure that i save whatever i'm making put myself in a safe place and then next year you know maybe put a month or two months gap in between work but then I still need to look at putting work after that because I'm not going to make no money from those other projects that I make potentially. Do you know what I mean? And having that mindset yeah. of going, you know what, I'm making this and I'm not necessarily going to make money. And again, going back to it, it doesn't mean that those passion projects you make aren't going to get success in festivals and stuff. But 
if you want to if you want to guarantee to be in a festival you have to make it for that festival but if you make something that's good like i'm as i say that park bench story i was talking about it was me and a friend um we were doing a short film acting in it together and um my friend nick who's uh, one of the characters in it i'd shown him the script and he read it and he's like oh my god i want to be in this so he called one of his friends forward uh, um he called one of his friends and uh, he said uh, lucas in he read it, he wanted to be in it, and we just went out and we shot it. And we didn't make it for, one day I was just sat there and I just started writing this monologue. And it was just kind of things that were in my head and this, and the story kind of happened and that was it. And we made it and that's like, we made it for no money. Like the cam, there was the, I had a Black Magic cinema camera, first one that had come out. Uh, we went to Hyde Park, it was legal to shoot there because you didn't have permission. We shot it in like two hours. And it's been in about 20 odd festivals, not necessarily big ones. It's won awards for things. And no one in the, not one of us made that for any other reason that we were like, this is a really sweet, heartwarming story. And it's, I put it on YouTube afterwards. It's had like 700,000 views. And the yeah. comments on that film, I get every single day, I get a couple of comments on it. And literally some of the comments moved me to tears. And it's like, that is more important to me than if I got in Cannes Film Festival with him, because who gives a fuck about that? Not me. But the fact that I've got these people who have got an opportunity to watch this film and they're like, wow, this has given me hope. This is what I want to meet somebody like that. I want this to happen to me and I want this to. And it's a bit like, again, it was this, it's called the definition of lonely. And it's a bit of a, you know, people watch it. Oh, definition of lonely. I feel lonely. But it spins around at the end. And mm -hmm. there's a slight, there's an element of hope in it. And I never even wrote it. In that. It just kind of come out from my subconscious at the time. And again, you write these things and you don't realize just because they mean something to you. So there's going to be other people like you at, who are going through that moment that you went through at the time you wrote it or made it, who experienced the same things. And sometimes all you need is a voice to, that's similar to yours to tell you that you're not on your own. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. That can be more important than anything. We get too bogged down by, you know, I need a big budget for this and I want this and we have a green screen there and a special effects. If an inter that's 12 minutes long and it's two people on a park bench talking. And almost what well, you can see your analytics on YouTube and nearly everybody gets to the end. It, I think it's something like 90% up to like nine minutes. So all the missing is the credits, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. the credits are too long. So it's, you go, well, that is, yeah, anyway. Is is that what Hollywood is, is missing in the last, say, like 10 years with effect-driven superhero films? Hollywood's a business with its own agenda. So I think we I think we should never associate Hollywood with filmmaking. Hollywood is what it is. Yeah. It's like entertainment for the masses. So it's like, it doesn't really matter about Hollywood. It doesn't really matter about Netflix. It doesn't really matter about, all it matters about is finding stories that you want to watch. That's the hardest part. That's the problem because we've got so many things that are like broadcast in our faces of watch this, watch this, watch this, watch yeah. this, but rooting through all the crap to find something that you want to watch. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But it's like, I think we kid out, I mean, we yeah hollywood and these big film industries they're not that it's got it's not about film it's a business it's it's like going oh well is that the problem with nike you know they've lost it. it's like no nike isn't about shoes isn't about trainers shoes sure. are to make you to enable you to walk or trainers are enabled to run not how many adidas and nike trainers now are designed for people running they're not about running even though yeah. they might have been created for that so don't kid ourselves in thinking that they're the same thing do you know what i mean yeah, um, absolutely. That's very insightful. Um, Out of Time was, um, or is, is a feature film that you directed that I, I've spoke to some of your colleagues about. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because again, that's that's a film that's still being promoted at the moment and it's getting tons of good reviews. People seem to really, really connect to it and, and really enjoy it. Um, how did that yeah. sort of come about? So that's, again, that's a passion project. And for me, it wasn't so much a passion project for me. This is the first time I've become on board on somebody else's passion project and actually tried to make that happen. So um, to get to how I did out of time, basically a few years ago, I made a film called Soft Flood, which was a play that I'd written. Um, I started telling that story earlier, didn't finish it. But anyway, it was about like, I've written this play and a friend of mine had said, oh, when I was filmmaking, you should make it, make your film because she'd read it. And I was like, well, it's not a film, it's a play. Anyway, I'd got to a point where I'd made a few shorts and I'd worked for a couple of people. I was like, I'm just going to make it. I made it. I'd raised about 
10, 15,000 pounds to pay for the cameras. To pay. So I bought everything. Again, if you're making stuff, try and buy everything. People will always say, don't and hire. That's silly. It's not buy, buy. Sure. Because you can always reuse it. And anyway, so I added to the kit that I already had. Uh, I wanted to make sure all the actors were paid. Um, we, again, we've got all the locations for free, most of them. Um, and I'd worked out to so shoot it in seven days and it was like 90 minutes long and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, we shut that. That was my passion project, even though other people came on board as a passion project, but they were all paid, but probably below what they should have. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. that got distribution and then it landed on Netflix UK. I was very lucky. And then everything kind of spun off from there, really. That's how I ended up doing all the things I've done now. So spring forward, uh, Michelle Billington, who's the producer of Out of Time, she knew that I'd done Soft Lad. She knew that like we'd done it for no money. Uh, and she was working with a writer friend of hers called Kerry. And she was like, look, we've got this project. Um, we've got a tiny budget. They had like no budget. I think they even had less than what I got for Soft Lad. And then they sent it to me and I read it and I was like, yeah. And the script was uh, the, the heart and soul of it was great. But what happened was um, within Soft Lad, a lot of the feedback that I got was, oh, it was very it was overwritten. Um, and again, it's so the, at, early on, I was like, well, it was a play and I just shot the play. Like I didn't go away and make a screenplay of it. I just shot what I'd written to be a play. And yeah. even that, I'd had no editing and whatever. So anyway, Kerry sent me, and I'm not a script editor in any way. She sent me her script and I was like, this is great. I said, the only thing is some of, we just need to strip it back a little bit in places just to get to the heart of it because it was very, it had a similar feel to what I'd done with Soft Lad. And anyway, Kerry was great. She was like, look, so we sat down and I was like, look, and all it was was just at points kind of, we once we'd got to the point of it, just kind of we trimmed it back because otherwise it would have been about two hours long or whatever. So Kerry went away and she just did a big edit on it and stuck it right down to the heart. And then I read it again and I was just in bits. Everybody was. She got right to the heart of it. And, you know, that's the thing with Kerry, like a dialogue is so witty, clever, like she's got she's from Liverpool like me, but she literally speaks the right and you can just hear all the different characters you know them all um and they said they've been working on it for a while they want to um shoot it they've cast some people they want so they brought me down and i met the people that they liked and i met some other people who hadn't been cast and wherever and then i put a couple of um because again from soft Lad, the reason why we got distribution really was dan brocklebank who was in it after we'd finished soft Lad, well he's already had a big name he'd done all kinds of films and he'd done emmerdale but he just got coronation street as well and then off the back of soft Lad, uh, when we did a screening johnny labby who played the lead role in it his agent came to see it and then put him up for a role in eastenders which he got so those two were in two prime time soap operas at the time so when the distribution saw it they were like oh we've got a chance yeah. of getting you know getting in on a market so i'd said to kerry i was like look you know we should cast people but michelle and kerry's vision is oh to help out people who haven't written like kind of why i did the show real business to help people who couldn't get into the industry and i was like look i get that but if we really want to like when it comes to sales and stuff like that you're not gonna no one's gonna just pick it up off the back of a store a domestic story it's really hard to sell something like that unless you're like uh you know one of the writers who specialize in that like a jimmy mcgovern or wherever um so again we kept all the leads people who were all experienced but hadn't necessarily had big tv breaks and then a couple of the cameo parts were like people who had a little bit more profile like uh, my friend suzanne who and lewis and bernie uh, who were in brookside with me and then um marcus collins who was in x factor and then we had nathan moore who was like um a 90s pop sensation who's literally as fan following crazy online um crazy in a good way by the way um so we kind of put this package together and my biggest concern at the time was they had 10 days to shoot it and where a soft lad was like five or six characters in literally two locations which when we made that we had one house and we dressed one one the top their floor as one house and then the bottom floor is another as another person's house so we literally were shooting in just one location and then one day to do all the exteriors that's this cool was that's cool yeah, well, I'd learned that kind of doing another short film that I'd done, which we, and we like slept in the house as well. So that kept costs down. So all the cast and like make parts and stuff. But Kerry's was like 100 houses, school, hospital, this. Th and I was just like, OK, right. And Michelle's a line producer as well. So she'd scheduled it and it was possible. But they were like, look, we don't have much money. But again, because I had all my own gear, I've got all my own lighting equipment, um, camera equipment and stuff, hiring me 
even though like they paid me, they brought me on board and I got a wage and whatever as director, but then also my kind of gear. I was like, well, mm -hmm. I can offer my gear for free. Do you know what I mean? Usually I'd charge, but I know Michelle um, and I'd really believed in the project. So I was kind of directing, but directing cameraman as well. And then she was like, oh, we're gonna, Michelle was like, we're gonna have some students from local university as the crew, um, which was fine, but I said, we need the DOP. So we got a young guy, Liam, and he was really lovely, but again, he's like a self-shooter. So um, I was kind of guiding hit. So I was, in some ways I was like teaching at the same time. So I was kind of teaching people about like backlights and positioning and whatever. And he was grafted a couple of days, he, you know, he knew how to light, I'm not discrediting him in any way, but it was just kind of giving him tips just to kind of give it a bit of an edge. Cause again, with soft lad, I brought a DOP in, um, but the equipment I had in soft lad was like four LED panels and two soft boxes. I didn't have any Ari lights, didn't have any back, it was just, so we did the best that we could with what it was, but I didn't know anything about it and I didn't know anything was gonna happen with it. But again, I want, without the time, it was my chance to kind of all the things that, not necessarily problems, but little things that I'd learned from soft lad, take it into this. So I wanted to make sure that it was lit well, make sure that, oh, someone's trying to call me. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was lit well. I wanted to make sure that, um, yeah, just all those little things. And again, within the writing, make sure that, you know, nobody could come from from that point of view. So, uh, and then the students who came on board again were lovely. But I remember one time I was like to one of the, I said, oh, could you just go and grab me a reflector, please? It's in the kit bag. <laughs> I came through with like a piece of tin foil. I was like, do you know what a reflector is? He was like, no. I said, just ask. I said, one thing you have, just ask if you don't know, no one's going to be. But there was some of those on the days. And at the time it was like, you know, yeah. I had like a steady cam kit on. I was like, steady cam. And, and yeah, literally yeah. the first day we shot, we finished at four o'clock and we were scheduled to finish at seven. I was like, oh, it's going to be really easy. Every day after that, we were lucky if we finished yeah. past 10 o'clock because, you know, we weren't working, you know, um, we were working the hours that we needed to get a shot. We were specifically locked down because, again, Kerry called in a lot of favours with locations and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of people, they were being paid. Everyone was being paid on it, but or at least expenses. Um, but it got to the point, literally, like, I remember at day 10 and, oh, my goodness, like, I'd just been living off donuts, put on so much weight. <laughs> literally my face was just dropping and Kerry come in and she was like oh um we're just going to do some behind the scenes can you come and do an interview I was like really so when's the bathroom and I'm not joking so to be and I nearly fainted because I was just exhausted yeah, and I didn't yeah. like I was so tired and my eyes had gone funny because literally I was just staring at the screen all the time and like at the yeah. camera on my back and all that I'm, I didn't say this to them I literally come out and I was like okay so I went in and she sat me down and asked me these questions I just look I look destroyed and it's somewhere online. You should put it on look to, but it's one of those things. It's like, again, I'm not recommending that anybody has to go out in, you know, try and destroy themselves, do the job. Yeah. But my thing was I committed to this, you know, I wanted to, cause it was also a thing for me to go, well, you know what, this is like, I want to make a, a next, another feature length film that is a step up from the one that I'd done before. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. And I just, I, even though I'm making something that's got no money in it, I'm, I want to specialize myself on being able to make something that still is, has got a decent kind of, something that could be broadcast on television. Absolutely. And no and it can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can. I mean, and a lot of people, you know, people come back from the comments uh, a lot of the time with this. You think we don't need to defend ourselves with what we made the project for what we made it. But when you're putting us up next to other projects that have been shot for like hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of pounds, I love that because I'm thinking, even though you're going, oh, it's not this, it's not that. No, it's not that. But it was also made for like less than 15 grand. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, it was also, so the things that you go to actually that you can actually put me next to those films. And even if you're trying to do it as a negative, it's a positive to me because of the resources that we had, the time that we got to shot to shoot it in, you know what I mean? It's like, so um, again, I never, you've got to, I remember early on, especially in all of the soft lad reviews, I just take it to heart sometimes. And I'm like, oh, wow. And it's like, you can't really, it's like, I didn't make it for, I made it for me. And yeah. then whatever anybody else takes from it, because even now people go, what's the message do you want people to get from out of time? I'm like, I want them to get whatever they want from it. Because once I've done it, it's my message for what I want it to be is done. Whatever yeah. anybody, it's like, that's the that's the definition of any type of art form, isn't it? It's like somebody paints something, what you see in that painting. It's, it's theirs now. It's, it's out there. You go yeah. enjoy yeah. it, love it or hate it. It's like, because Kerry's always like, oh, oh, the reviews are this, this and this and this, that old. I said, Kerry, early on, I said, look, 
if you love all the good ones, just be prepared because there will be bad ones. Sure. It's not that the film's bad and she's like that. What, you know, she doesn't care. She's like, she's just made up that she's got to make something that she's been working so hard and so course. long. So, of course. You know. Um, absolutely. Um, what What do you have uh, planned for the next um, so 12 months? Because, you know, again, COVID and everything else, 2021 is going to be another strange year with what we can and can't do. Yeah, so I'm literally like, I'm working between Hollyoaks, um, Coronation Street and Emmerdale now, but for the, like, I've just finished the block on, well, finished the shoot yesterday. Is that directing? So, you're, you're directing, direct, yeah. Directors. Yeah, so I work on, the, like, I've been working on Hollyoaks for about two and a half years and I've done Emmerdale for the past 12 months. And then I worked, I started on Coronation Street a couple of months ago, I did a block there. And then now, so basically how they work is you finish a block and then they'll book you for your next one. But because I'm working between the three, so it's like I just finished Hollyoaks. I'm, I'm on Emmerdale now, script, um, develop, um, what you call it, uh, pre-shooting scripts. But at the same time, I'm like, they all, because they all booked in an overlap. And because COVID happened, every time I block them, and I was just like, yeah, I'll take it. And then again, I'm going to have an out of time moment where I collapse because it's like, but it's fine. So like those... The, my last block of Hollyoaks is being edited now, so I'll have like a week working on them with the editor. And then I've got the scripts for Emmerdale that I'm working on now, and then I start shooting about three weeks. And then I'm doing two blocks of Emmerdale. Then I've got another job penciled in, but it's not confirmed, which isn't one of them. So once that's confirmed, and then I go back to do another Coronation Street. So basically till December, I've got work booked in with that. And then that's when... So I said to my agent now, because I managed to get an agent for directing just to manage it all. And I'm like, then sure. I want to try and have a gap and see, because I've got a TV, a couple, well, two TV projects that I've written, like that I've done storylines for and I've done, one of them I've done like the first two episodes and then I've done a pilot for the other one. And then I've got another TV show, which I directed. Um, we did like a three part like web series, but we didn't put it out. And now we're developing it potentially for a TV show. That's with a production company who are trying to see if we can get that off the ground. So I'm attached as director to that if it comes off. And then I've got a film called um, Double the Odds, which is about um, two sisters who don't know the sisters and one of them's a police officer and the other. It's really funny. Um, a friend of mine, Louise, has written it. And so I'm attached to that and they're trying to get funding for that. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's like, I've got loads of things potentially in the pipeline. And then I've got just my regular work, which is booked in touch wood. Thank God, thank you universe. Please get rid of Corona so we can go back to working normally. Yeah, so probably I, I hopefully want to do something, um, maybe a uh, something original just because I love working on the subs. For me, it's like going home. It's my background. It's where I trained. That's where I grew up. And, you know, and on the floor, you never have a better time than what you have when you're working uh, on soap Good. operas. Sure. But I do want to have that kind, you know, when, you, when you're working on something that's never been shot before, you know, and you're working with actors from scratch and the actors are still, because when you go into a soap, there's only so much you can direct the actors who have been doing it for 20. You of can't course. say, oh, I think you do this. It's a bit like, hang on a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah you're I know. Because, yeah. To mold the story because, you know, they're working over 20 episodes a week sometimes. So mm -hmm. your job is to keep them on track and make sure that we're hitting the story points. And so you're still directing and you're still working in that way. But it's a, when different, you've got, it's a different game different isn't it and it's just nice to kind of sit with a character who's like trying to find that character and again i never believe in telling them how to play it but they're wanting to get somewhere and maybe giving them points to try and help them get there and i love that you know it's like it's what we got to do a lot with out of time uh, you know the a lot of the scenes in it it's very liverpool and there's a lot of drama in it but when we were rehearsing it there was a lot more drama and um jamie and kerry because they've been friends for so long, when they were in the middle of scenes, it always turned into a big row. And my thing is there's a big scene at the top of like a hill. And I said to them from the beginning, I said, look, that's our journey. We're aiming to that scene. That's the scene where it can be explosive. I said, we can't do that. I said, we've got to build to that point to be able to earn that point. Mm -hmm. Said that's like, so I said all the other stuff. Said, yeah, but I'd do this to him now. I said, yeah, but you've got to be clever with that. You know, you want to get him to a point not everything has to get to a point through argument so let's play so tw you know trying to kind of and again it's like that for me was really lovely to be able to and when we when they saw the final version of it they were like oh i get what you mean and you know we've earned you have the certain things in films you, have to, you know um, yeah it's like in again for those as the actors they're they're in the moment they're in the emotion of it and sometimes it's for me to go you know what i get that emotion but let's find a way to channel it in a different way so that when we get to that point we, the audience are with you and on your side rather than just being a slanger match all the way through so um again it's like 
And again, you do get to do stuff like that within soaps, but generally within soaps, they're looking at the long game. So it's all managed within the scripts and, you know, the producers have a sure. lot of work on that as well. So yeah. um, hopefully I get to do a bit more of that next year. Sure. Yeah, here's hoping. Um, Leon, I, I want to thank you for, for your time with us today because I've, I've kept you for longer, but it's been a, a fascinating um, journey and story from, from how you got to where you are now. Last question would be, I suppose, if you could go back and meet your younger self, yeah, say 20 years ago, uh, or even back back at school when you suddenly had that moment, you're like, actually, I, I, I want to do do acting. If you could speak to your younger self now, what, what would you tell them? You know what? I think of this sometimes and I think, I don't think I tell them anything. I think I just watch them and just laugh at myself, see what I was doing, <laughs> and just kind of take it in. Because I don't want to, and like, and it sounds, I'm not like, I'm not in the best place I could potentially be in. I've made loads of mistakes, you know, I've owned properties, I've sold properties, I've had money, I've had no money, but I don't think I'd change any of them now because where I am right now and my insights into things of like how to live my life and things, I'm really, really in a good, you know, I, I wouldn't even go, oh, I'm not like, oh, ecstatic with it, but I just, I'm enjoying it and I've, I'm still on a journey and I'm still finding things and I've got a place to go. I wouldn't want to get here any quicker than what I've got here, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Because I just yeah, it think, does. it does. Because every time I look back, I always think, oh, if I made this, like I had opportunities within music early on where uh, working with producers who had bigger names than when I was doing some stuff solo and I didn't take it. And I know for a fact, I probably potentially would have had a, a, a single release on maybe a decent label or something but I think for me I think was that would have probably ended badly I don't know you know I wasn't experienced enough I wasn't in the right place or whatever and so I think time. that this wasn't my time and this is where I'm meant to be right now I think so I would I'd love to go back and just watch myself to see how I walked to see how I the spoke haircut, whatever yeah yeah like and see how I was with my friends and I'd like to yeah. just sit back yeah. and observe myself but I don't think I'd tell them anything Sure, you you just pass by and give yourself a look. Yeah, but, you know, you just give it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I get that. Um, Liam, thank you so much for your time uh, speaking with us today. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. Sorry for talking so much. <laughs> no, no, that's that's the best interview. That that's 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 the best ones. <laughs>